The events of the Book of Ruth took place during the time of the Judges, a terrible period in Israel's history in which a vicious cycle kept repeating itself. The people fell into idolatry. God allowed their enemies to oppress them. They cried out to him for deliverance. He raised up a judge to rescue them, and they fell back into idolatry. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Two. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilian. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem, Judah and they went to Moab and lived there. Ruth, chapter 1, verses 1 to 2. As the author of the book of Judges says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did whatever seemed right to him. Judges, chapter 21, verse 25. As a result, the famine that existed in the land when the Book of Ruth begins was most likely a result of God punishing Israel for idolatry. To get relief from it, a man named Elimelech, who was from Bethlehem in Judah's tribal territory, took his wife, Naomi, and two sons and went to stay in Moab. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Ruth, chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Elimelech died while they were in Moab, leaving Naomi a widow. Her sons married Moabite women named Orpah and Ruth, but both died after only ten years in Moab. Naomi was abandoned, both by her two children and by her husband. As a result, things had only gotten worse for this Abrahamic descendant. Naomi had become a widow and childless in order to avoid the dangers of famine. Her circumstances had deteriorated to the point where she had no way of supporting herself in Moab. Naomi and Ruth returned to Bethlehem. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has turned against me. Ruth, chapter 1, verses 6 through 13. When Naomi learned that the famine in her native Israel had ended, she made the decision to return to Judah. She encouraged her daughters-in-law to return to their childhood homes in Moab, and she prayed that God would bless each of them with a new husband. 
She wished for God to be gracious to them, which may indicate that she believed they had placed themselves under God's covenant, covering by marrying Israelite men. In any case, Naomi felt that the women would be squandering their lives if they stayed with her, because she couldn't provide either with another husband or herself because she was more or less destitute. As she puts it, the Lord's hand had turned against her. Yet it was through her very difficult situation that God was about to work in a big way. At this they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Ruth Chapter 1, verses 14 through 19. Regardless of what Naomi said, Ruth was determined to stay with her. Despite the fact that Orpah turned back, Ruth said, Wherever you go, I will go. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. She even swore an oath to stay with her mother-in-law for the rest of her life. Her devotion was so strong that she preferred widowhood and its difficulties to abandoning Naomi and her God, implying that she'd come to believe in him in part because of the woman's testimony. Ruth had clearly made a complete break with her past by rejecting the Moabites' idolatry and embracing Israel's God as her own. Because Ruth was adamant, Naomi stopped attempting to persuade her, and the two women returned to Bethlehem. Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Ruth, chapter 1, verses 20 through 22. Naomi returned to Israel as a broken, bitter woman. She told her hometown's people, The Lord has opposed me, and the Almighty has afflicted me. In other words, Naomi felt she had nothing to show for her devotion to her husband or to God by returning to her homeland empty-handed. Nonetheless, she recognized that both good and bad circumstances are orchestrated by the Lord. In His sovereignty, He either causes or allows events to occur. And while Naomi was truly despondent, the barley harvest was approaching. She could see that God had put an end to the famine, which had driven her family away and to their graves. In the midst of her hopelessness, there was hope. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, Go ahead, my daughter. She went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. 
As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Ruth, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. God was preparing sleepy Bethlehem, Naomi's hometown, and the male lead to whom we're introduced here as the site of his miraculous interruption at a later point in history through this story. Micah, chapter 5, verse 2, KJV. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, thou though be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be the ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Boaz was a wealthy relative of Elimelech and the son of Rahab, the same former prostitute who hid Israel's spies and survived the fall of Jericho due to her faith in God, as Matthew chapter 1 verse 5 reveals. Matthew chapter 1 verse 5 Solomon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Ruth desired to serve and care for Naomi, so she requested to go into the fields and collect fallen grain. The law of Moses, as if given with Ruth and Naomi in mind, provided for the poor by commanding the Israelites to leave some grain behind at harvest time so that the poor could gather it and eat. Deuteronomy chapter 24 verses 19 through 21. When you are harvesting your crops and forget to bring in a bundle of grain from your field, don't go back to get it. Leave it for the foreigners, orphans, and widows. Then the Lord your God will bless you in all you do. When you beat the olives from your olive trees, don't go over the boughs twice. Leave the remaining olives for the foreigners, orphans, and widows. When you gather the grapes in your vineyard, don't glean the vines after they are picked. Leave the remaining grapes for the foreigners, orphans, and widows. So Ruth went behind the harvesters to gather grain. But seemingly by chance, she happened to be in Boaz's section of the field. Every time we see what we believe to be a coincidence in the Bible, we should look at it as providence. Of course, nothing happens by chance, and no one happens to be anywhere at any given time. The author's use of happened to be acknowledges God's providential working in Ruth's life. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, Who does that young woman belong to? The overseer replied, She is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field, and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting, and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you, and whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. 
May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. 13. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come over here, have some bread, and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. 15. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men. Let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up, and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered, and it amounted to about an ephah. 18. She carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. Ruth, chapter 2, verses 4 through 18. When Boaz arrived and learned who the gleaning woman was, he was moved by her plight and offered her provision and safety. Ruth couldn't understand why he had chosen her, especially since she was a Moabitess a foreigner in Israel. Boaz basically told her that she was simply reaping the benefits of the life she had chosen. Her kindness, service to her mother-in-law, and decision to seek refuge in the Lord's provision had brought her blessing. Ruth's concern for Naomi would have been especially meaningful to Boaz because Naomi's husband was a relative. Because of Ruth's steadfast commitment, Boaz bestowed a blessing on her, requesting that the Lord, under whose wings she had come for protection, provide her with a spiritual covering. Ruth responded with humble gratitude. Then, Boaz generously provided her with additional assistance, more than the law required, so she wouldn't have to work as hard to provide for herself and Naomi. Her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, he has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, That man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. Ruth, chapter 2, verses 19 through 20. Naomi was pleased to see how well Ruth had done in her gleaning that evening but she was surprised to learn that Boaz was the one who had shown her such kindness. Naomi recognized right away that this was no chance meeting. God's sovereign hand had made a connection for them. She informed Ruth that one of their family redeemers was Boaz. Boaz could fulfill the law of leveret marriage as a family redeemer or kinsman redeemer. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 through 10, New King James Version. If brothers dwell together, and one of them dies and has no son, the widow of the dead man shall not be married to a stranger outside the family. Her husband's brother shall go into her, take her as his wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. 6. And it shall be that the firstborn son which she bears will succeed to the name of his dead brother, 
that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. 7. But if the man does not want to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate to the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to raise up a name to his brother in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. 8. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak to him. But if he stands firm and says, I do not want to take her, 9. Then his brother's wife shall come to him in the presence of the elders, remove his sandals from his foot, spit in his face, and answer and say, So shall it be done to the man who will not build up his brother's house. 10. And his name shall be called in Israel, the house of him who had his sandal removed. This was an ancient provision that stated that if an Israelite man died without a son to carry on his family name, the man's brother could provide for him by marrying his widow. Then the first son she bore would carry on the name of the dead brother, so his name would not be blotted out from Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 25 verse 6 then Ruth the Moabite said, He even said to me, Stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him, because in someone else's field you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Ruth, chapter 2, verses 21 through 23. Given God's word's provision and the divine connection that had occurred between Ruth and Boaz, Naomi encouraged Ruth to continue working in Boaz's field. Naomi was correct in her assessment that God had been gracious to them during their time of grief and loss. However, he had also extended his sovereign hand over these circumstances in order to use them for larger kingdom purposes, which the women would not be able to comprehend in their lifetimes. Make no mistake. God can similarly work through your current circumstances to bring about future blessings and even to change the world, whether or not you can connect all the dots this side of eternity. One day, Ruth's mother-in-law Naomi said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Now Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. Ruth Chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Knowing the difficulties Ruth faced as a widow, Naomi decided to become a matchmaker in order for Ruth to have a secure home and future. She told her to dress up and go to Boaz's threshing floor that night. The threshing floor was where the winnowing would take place, separating the barley from the inedible chaff. Boaz would have spent the night there during the harvest to prevent grain theft. Naomi advised Ruth to uncover his feet and lie down once he had finished eating and drinking and had gone to bed for the night. When Boaz realized his feet were cold, he would awake and take note from her. This were some tactics that the younger Ruth might have not known. However, she had Naomi, the wiser matchmaker, on her side. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. 
When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? he asked. I am your servant Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. Ruth, chapter 3, verses 5 through 9. Ruth agreed to Naomi's instructions and carried them out precisely. Boaz finally lay down for the night after a long day of work and a full stomach. Ruth then approached. He awoke with his feet exposed, perhaps feeling the cool of the evening, and was surprised to find a woman lying at his feet. Because it was dark, he asked Ruth to identify herself, to which she replied, I am Ruth, your servant. Take me under your wing, because you are a family savior. Ruth was proposing marriage with these words and actions. She was also requesting that Boaz fulfill his legal obligation as a family redeemer. Ruth was reminding him of the blessing he had previously bestowed on her by asking him to take her under his wing. Boaz had said to her, May you receive a full reward from the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Chapter 2, verse 12. Ruth was challenging him to become the human expression of that divine covering. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am a guardian redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning if he wants to do his duty as your guardian redeemer, good, let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. Ruth, chapter 3, verses 10 through 13. Ruth had initially impressed Boaz, but she impressed him even more that night. Ruth had not pursued younger men, despite the fact that Boaz was older. This insight, however, was from Naomi and Naomi's wisdom made Ruth a star in Boaz's mind. Boaz was a kind and generous man. Naomi knew this would be needed in Ruth's life. However, Boaz was aware of a complication in the situation. Despite the fact that he was a family redeemer, there was another redeemer who was even closer to him. In other words, because this other relative was closer to Ruth's deceased husband, he qualified to redeem her ahead of Boaz if he so desired. However, if the man refused to raise an heir for his deceased relative, Boaz vowed to fulfill the obligation and marry Ruth. Boaz was a man of honor. Don't overlook the word redeem, which appears several times in verses 12 and 13. Boaz is presented as an Old Testament type or picture of Jesus Christ who redeemed or bought back sinners from slavery to sin through its use. We are forgiven, set free from sin, made new creations, and have a new relationship with God because of Christ our Redeemer. Romans chapter 3, verses 23 through 24. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 24. And all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Gal, chapter 3. 
verses 13 through 14. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 through 14. And you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. If Boaz redeems Ruth, she will be freed from her impoverished circumstances and formally adopted into God's chosen family. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized. And he said, No one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, Bring me the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and placed the bundle on her. Then he went back to town. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, How did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, He gave me these six measures of barley, saying, Don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then Naomi said, Wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. Ruth, chapter 3, verses 14 through 18. Ruth rose and left while it was still dark, so that no one would see her and misinterpret the night's events, causing them to lose face. However, before she left, Boaz gave her a generous supply of barley. Ruth returned home with the food and the news, and Naomi was confident that Boaz would fulfill his promise. Naomi knew something had been stirred up in Boaz that will ensure that Ruth was redeemed. Ruth's actions were over now. It was all on Boaz to redeem her. In a sense, she had given her life to Boaz. It was his job to ensure that the process was performed legally and her security afterwards was established. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat down there just as the guardian redeemer he had mentioned came along. Boaz said, Come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, Sit here. And they did so. Ruth, chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. Boaz went to the town gate where business and civic activities were held. Soon after, the family redeemer mentioned by Boaz arrived. As a result, the scene was set for the story's climax. Boaz invited the man to sit down with him and asked ten of the town's elders to join them. These men would serve as witnesses of the legal proceedings that were about to transpire. Then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative Amalek. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me so I will know for no one has the right to it except you, and I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. Ruth chapter 4 verses 3 through 5 Boaz informed the nameless man that the widow Naomi, who had recently returned from Moab, needed money and would be selling a portion of the field that belonged to their close relative, Amalek. As a result, because he was the closest relative, the man had first dibs on the land. If you want to redeem it, go ahead and do it, Boaz said. 
Otherwise, Boaz planned to do so because he was the next in line. Boaz dropped the other, less appealing piece of information when the man jumped at the chance to acquire some new land. If the man redeemed the land, he would also be redeeming the widow Ruth for a wife in order to keep the man's name on his land. That meant that the economic acquisition was accompanied by a social acquisition. At this, the guardian redeemer said, Then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Now, in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the guardian redeemer said to Boaz, Buy it yourself. And he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilian, and Malan. Ruth, Chapter 4 verses 6 through 9. When he realized he'd have to take someone else's bride along with the property, the man's eagerness began to wane. Obtaining land was one thing, acquiring a wife was quite another. He would jeopardize his own inheritance by attempting to preserve his relative's name. As a result, he refused his right to redemption. You couldn't sign some legal documents and have them notarized in Israel at the time. As a result, the custom of a man giving his sandal to another party with whom he was doing business ratified a legally binding transaction of this nature. The man gave Boaz his sandal in front of ten witnesses, symbolically granting Boaz the legal right to redeem the property and Ruth. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, Malon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today you are witnesses. Ruth, chapter 4, verse 10. Unlike the man who was concerned about destroying his own inheritance, Boaz's motivations were more selfless. He acquired Ruth and the property out of concern for others. He wanted to keep the deceased man's name on his property so that it would not be lost among his relatives or on the gate of his hometown. This sacrifice reminds me of a New Testament principle. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it but whoever loses his life because of me will find it. Matthew chapter 16, verse 25. When we lay down our priorities for the sake of God's kingdom, blessings often follow. Selfishness tends to turn off the blessing faucet. Then the elders and all the people at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem. 12. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. Ruth, chapter 4 verses 11 through 12. The elders witnessed the proceedings and bestowed blessings on Boaz and his future wife. They prayed to God to bless Ruth as he had blessed Rachel and Leah, who gave birth to many of Israel's fathers. They also prayed that Boaz's name and house would become well known in Israel as a result of the children the Lord would give him through this young woman. They had no idea how famous Boaz would become or how talented his offspring would be. Matthew chapter 1 verses 5 through 17 
lets us know that David and Christ himself would come from this line. Naomi gains a son. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Ruth, chapter 4, verses 13 through 15. Boaz and Ruth married, and God blessed them with a son named Obed. The women of the town rejoiced with Naomi and thanked the Lord for providing for this poor woman who had experienced great bitterness only a short time before. They even told Naomi that Ruth was more valuable to her than seven sons. Seven sons would have been a supreme blessing because seven was the biblical number of perfection or completion. Ruth, on the other hand, had proven to be an even better gift, thanks to God's grace. That's a lot of praise for this noble lady. For her faithfulness, God had blessed Ruth with a child, even as he would bless Mary many years later with the Son of God. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 33. NKJV Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. 16. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. The Genealogy of David 18. This then is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. 19. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. 20. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. 21. Salmon, the father of Boaz. Boaz, the father of Obed. 22. Obed, the father of Jesse and Jesse the father of David. Ruth, chapter 4, verses 16 through 22. The book's final verses reveal a genealogy, starting with Judah's son Perez and ending with David. It tells us that Ruth and Boaz's son Obed would be David, the great king of Israel's grandfather. The author's target audience, the ancient Israelites, were well aware of their illustrious ancestors. What they didn't realize was that there would be an even greater descendant from this bloodline. David's kingly line would eventually lead to the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who would be born in this ancestral home, Bethlehem. Though Boaz and Ruth were unaware of it, 
Their lives and decisions were part of God's grand plan for the kingdom. By submitting to the Lord's agenda, you open yourself up to His sovereign purposes, not only for your own benefit, but potentially for the benefit of future generations. The Book of Ruth tells a tale of love and respect between two women from vastly different worlds. Gentle and loving Ruth, a Moabite, cared deeply for her mother-in-law, Naomi. Ruth willingly left her comfort zone and the only world she had ever known to travel with Naomi to foreign Bethlehem. She exemplifies the strength and determination leaders must have to venture out and follow God, even if it means leaving family and friends behind. Ruth surrendered to Naomi's instructions in this strange and new culture. Boaz, her kinsman redeemer, eventually married her and bestowed security and protection on her. But when Ruth made the decision to follow Naomi's instructions, she had no idea how things would turn out. She simply took a leap of faith. Naomi prayed that Ruth would be known throughout Israel for her good deeds, and God is still answering that prayer today as millions turn to the Book of Ruth for memorable lessons on love and faithfulness. Ruth, the foreigner, found a permanent place in the lineage of our Savior, Jesus Christ, as the great-grandmother of King David.